we'd go down a couple of days before the U.S. Open, climb some lift towers, put up stickers, and then you'd go there like eight years later, like, God damn, that sticker is still there, right? Welcome to the Not Snowboarding Podcast, episode number 59. I'm your host, Nate Musan. Today we chat with the founders of Rome Snowboards. Paul and Josh share the story behind leaving Burden and founding Rome. They discuss guerrilla marketing tactics that were directly inspired by Shepherd Ferry. They share their love for European Resort POW. We touch on their thoughts on industry-wide pricing challenges and much, much more. Before we jump into the episode, I want to invite you to join me in Bear Valley, California on March 2nd through the 6th for the second annual The Not Snowboarding Podcast Camp, or TNSP Camp. As you may know from earlier episodes, the TNSP camp was an idea born of the 32 snowboard boot camps that I've attended over the years. We tried it out last year at Seven Springs in Pennsylvania with the simple goal of getting together podcast listeners on the snow affordably for a couple of days of fun. Even though we had pretty challenging conditions, everyone made the best of it, and I'd say it was a huge success. This year, we've rented a condo on the hill in Bear Valley. It's actually the condo right next to mine. It'll be stocked with beer, breakfast items, snacks, and other party supplies. I've organized a shuttle to pick up and drop off folks from the Sacramento airport for anyone that's flying in. We'll have three days on snow, Saturday through Monday. We'll have a giant vegan dinner like last time uh, on the very first night. And there's unlimited backcountry and sidecountry options right outside the door of the condo. There's also snowmobile rentals available as well. We'll shoot to record a live episode again with a surprise special guest. All of this and more is included for the price of $430, 200 of which is due as a deposit on December 1st and the balance on February 20th. I don't want to sound like a sales guy, but three of the 16 spots already booked via a Facebook post I put up yesterday as kind of a feeler, so you might want to act fast if you're interested. If you have any questions about TNSP Camp, shoot me an email at nate at shredsouls.com. Hope to see you there. Finally, as you know, the Not Snowboarding Podcast is brought to you by Shred Soul's Performance Snowboarding and Skateboarding Insoles. Later this week, we're having a pre-sale for the brand new snowboarding insole. This insole is the culmination of several years of design refinements on the current snow model. We've added a much-requested high-density gel insert to the heel, a pour-on foot pad that disperses impact energy and chatter. We've structurally redesigned the insole, making it stronger and even more durable, and given the whole thing an antimicrobial coating to help keep your boots from stinking. Most importantly, these are hands down the most comfortable snowboarding insoles ever created. If you have interest in getting in on the pre-sale, I think the deal is going to be around 25% off of the retail price and free shipping for one day only. Just sign up to the Shred Soles mailing list at the bottom of the homepage at www.shredsoles.com. Okay, no more shameless self-promotion. On to the episode with the Rome Founders. So we've got a little chair logistics going now. We're starting to uh, making sure it's starting to get settled in. Stunt chair here. Yeah, yeah, a trick chair. Head splitters. Mm. Who are we yelling with? So this is AJ. Hey AJ. What's up? Who am I speaking with? This is Paul. Paul, okay. How's it going, Paul? Um, um, yeah, it's pretty good. Where are you sitting? Um, uh, in my house in Truckee, California. Nice. Still, yep. went, still full on winter. Um, yeah, there's a lot of snow. It's just, it's pretty sunny though. It's kind of warm today. Huh. I don't know if it's supposed. To, it snowed like a couple of days ago, like quite not a lot, like ten inches or so. But I think it's supposed to snow tomorrow night. Nice. A little bit. We're, we're, we were just talking. It looks like we might get another. There's a there's some weather that may or may not be maybe a dusting. It may be ten inches or so. I listened to the official yeah, yeah. Um, Montpelier weather report that um, my wife's uncle swears by, and he guarantees us at least six inches. <laughs> Where? That's right. That's a good point. Probably Roger. <laughs> probably Roger Hill. Right. Yeah. Kill your guy. AJ okay. Josh is here as well. Hey Josh, how's it going? Hey AJ, how you doing? I'm doing great. 
Do so, I need to lean at this thing when I talk? Or no, I no. Um, it looks like everybody is good. I've got to set up kind of pick up 360 you degrees. Supposed to, put it, supposed to put your mouth fully around the mic <laughs> and then talk it. That's how Nate does it. <laughs> you, you haven't seen this mic, apparently. <laughs> he has the same one, so no. I guess you would know. Maybe you have. <laughs> <laughs> so... We just kind of walk into these, you know. There's no official intro or anything, but um, we're not we're not live on the air. Right now. We're not live on the air anywhere. No, uh, and and that's one of the unless, biggest. Unless we're being hacked right now. It's possible. Yeah, the CIA could be listening. Right. We're being, they're probably listening. So the NSBCA is, is listening live, but the rest of our main audience will won't hear this for a little bit. Okay. So you guys have probably told this story a thousand times. But I think it would be good for everyone in our audience to hear what was the first conversation about Rome, and okay. you know how did it how did it start for you? Right, so we're recording this now. We're recording now. Oh, okay. We just walked right in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Classic <laughs> podcast. Is this on every podcast? Yeah, yeah. We're recording. Start talking. Uh. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember exactly when our first conversation about it was, but you know, just to step back a second, uh, you know, Paul and I have known each other um, since our sophomore year of college, uh, and um, we snowboarded, you know, late '80s together uh, in, um, while we were in college, and then just after college, um, we, you know, diverged for a couple of years. Um, uh, um, but stayed close, you know, and, and um, connected a lot. Went to Tuckerman Ravine a lot together. Um, he visited me out, in, or we, we, we met up in um, Salt Lake City and met a mutual friend out there when I was living out west. Um, but then um, Paul, you know, worked at Burton before I did, by five years or so, and somewhere along the line while we were there, you know, we started talking about you know the possibility of of branching out and doing our own thing and um so someplace in 99 or 2000 probably we had the conversation of two people that had been in snowboarding for a long time had worked in snowboarding for a pretty long time um and somehow got to a conversation of hey yeah maybe Maybe this is a good time for us to do our own thing and, and, you know, explore that avenue, given, you know, how the whole industry was at the time, you know, and the kind of brands that were in the industry in 1999 or 2000, um, and what we thought we could contribute. And, yeah, it, it started there as a one-on-one -on -one conversation. We bought a couple of cheap, cheap computers uh, and then eventually went for it, yeah. I totally forgot about this computer. <laughs> so, I mean, like the Best Buy and bought like identical matching compacts or something. Yeah, I think so. They they, they worked here for a while, you know, as like uh, warranty computers mm -hmm. for a little bit. It's uh, funny. One of the things you get, did that stood with me before I think before uh, Rome was officially launched and, and had boards in the marketplace is you went on a tour and you talked with retailers, right? And they have. I think something from that initial on deal accounts and tour. Yeah, it may, may have been a secondary or tertiary one, but uh, yeah, I've had that since early two thousands. Yeah, I mean, I, I, before we get to that question, I will I will step back to that prior question a little bit, um, just as a kind of a funny anecdote about it. Is that you know when I was living in Breckenridge in nineteen ninety eighty nine ninety it might have been Christmas time, so it might have been nineteen eighty nine. Um, you know, I remember being on a chairlift one time and thinking to myself, I was alone on a chairlift to Breckenridge, um, and thinking to myself, it would be really cool to start a snowboard company. You know, Paul's an engineer. He can do the engineering side. I don't know what the hell I'll do, but I'll do something. <laughs> um, and then my brain went to, God, but there's Kemper in the industry, and there's Look, and there's Sims and Burton, of course. And now there's way too many brands in the industry. You know, you know we can never do that. You know, and anyhow, that <laughs> in some ways the conversation about starting a company, was, the seeds were planted there. Yeah, came into my mind at one point. And I shot it down, kind of sure. immaturely at one point in time. So, um, so that was 
that was kind of funny. And I don't think I ever told Paul that because I thought it was an impossible idea as a 23 year old. Um, but it wasn't impossible. It was not an impossible idea. It was probably would probably been a great time to start one. Yeah, in hindsight, of course. Yeah, yeah. One one thing I was just thinking of as you were. You know, we haven't told the story a thousand times, but a hundred times maybe. Um, <laughs> um, one th- one thing that uh, <clears throat> popped into my head then was. Um, the competitors part of the motivation i think i remember us asking those kind of big questions okay what is this bring going to be and it was it did come down to kind of what brand would we if we weren't working at burton at the time like what brand would we ride like what brands products and so that's where we sort of you know so obviously we were working both of us were working on on burton products and we're you know obviously doing our best that we could there um but there weren't a lot of other brands that we were that really drew us in right. as long time snowboarders. It just there wasn't any clear path. And I'm not saying other companies didn't have decent product at the time, but at the same time the whole package, whether it was product and brand affiliation and messaging and stuff, there just wasn't anything that appealed to us. Obviously, there was other companies in the business and so that did work for some, but um and then the other point of that was, you know, how big the ski companies were at the time in snowboarding. And that always resonated as a, as a that just doesn't make sense because right. we were, I was, I don't think I was ever kicked off, but we, when we were early snowboarding, we couldn't go to resorts, obviously, which is true of a lot of guys, but um, then we were getting tested to see if we could ride on resorts. It was just a different world. And so, you know, there's just kind of, it was the ski industry was slow to embrace snowboarding and at the same time like why should they benefit on the on the brand side so that's that was kind of the other thing that was going through my mind was like yeah we let's and burton had a lot of strong points for sure but there were also things that we thought we could work around and, and exist coexist with them too so how, how did those what, comp- did, what did the testing what I, what was the testing <laughs> about like i don't understand to test the right resorts Oh, oh, yeah. There was Perfect. this thing called um, um, certification that existed in the mid to late eighties, um, and they did determined whether you could be allowed on the mountain at all, or if you had to be stuck on the green trails, or you're allowed to go on the blue trails, or you're allowed to go on the black trails. And so, uh, we had passes at Jay Peak in like eighty six, eighty seven before Stowe or Sugarbush allowed. And you had to take a certification test there that year to be determined, again, which level and what trails you were allowed to go on. A college friend of ours, um, who's actually a pretty good snowboarder, um, for some reason, didn't impress uh, the, the guys in charge enough that day, and he was stuck on the blue Lowell, blue Lowell trails. Um, it was a little hard. Yeah, and I think Bud Keen might have been there that day. I don't. He wasn't our tester, but he he worked at JP Peak in those um, early, mid eighty years. And I went through to Stratton one time as a college kid, maybe as a sophomore, so eighty six range. Um, and all the testers there were like Burton team riders to some degree, and it was obviously the epicenter of snowboarding in the East Coast at the time. And they definitely threw your attitude right. They were the ones to determine. Are you worthy or are you not worthy? And it was pretty intimidating too, right? Because you, here you were, you know, as a 19-year-old or whatever, and snowboarding was really young. And here was a guy in a uniform, and he was sponsored by Burton, and he was the he was the dude in charge. And, Gatekeeper. And he basically said, yeah, you're, you're good enough or you're not good enough. Um, that all ended when in the, like, 1990, 91, because the resorts realized that it increased their liability instead of decreased it. Um, because when they uh, approved somebody to go on the mountain and that person got hurt or hurt somebody else, their liability went through the roof. And so the insurance right. industry is what ended it, not the ski industry. The insurance industry said, yeah, you're increasing your liability. So it stopped around 1990, 1991 or something probably. And that rule virtually didn't exist for skiers. Ever. All right. And right. Right. Okay. Ever. I was, was going to ask. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Take these. Get on the lift. Do whatever the hell you if want. If you've ever Good seen luck. that YouTube clip, which I'm sure you have, of that Canadian resort in like 1986 or 87 and the yeah. ski area operator and the ski patrolman making comment about the snowboarders being missiles that are out of control and drunk. Uh, you know, yeah. that was the attitude, right? There was a few way out of control dudes coming on the slopes and they needed to be tested. Um, so, so, um, so, so yeah. It's just like a gauntlet. 
you had to like pass through and like everything like like even if you didn't dress right like they'd be like i don't know like this person doesn't look like I, they know what they're doing. I actually had to administer it at Sugarbush. The first year Sugarbush allowed, which was 88, 89, our se- post Paul's my senior year, um, uh, I was an instructor. Uh, or I tried to avoid being an instructor and just get the free pass, but I was technically an instructor. And so I had to yeah. give a couple um, of those tests to people. And uh, I forget. I, I probably was pretty lenient, right? You know, I wanted to let the snowboarders on the mountain. Um, sure. I'm guessing I probably sure. was. <laughs> this, is when, this is when somebody comes out of the woodwork. You! You shut me down on that powder day. Um, but sorry, I, I digressed. I digressed into the past a little bit. Um, and Nate had the, the question with this um, glass that he has here that's uh, that, we, that we gave out at a dealer council. So, yeah, the dealer council was... Um, Something that we did for the first several years, and it looks like you probably came to one of the ones in year three or something by the look of the logo on it, Um, and or year four, and we actually did a tour before our first trade show, so we we officially started paying ourselves and other people here in November of two thousand and two, and Sully, our sales guy, came on and. Pretty shortly thereafter, maybe a month and a half after that, before SIA, we did our first dealer council tour, which was kind of an expression of the syndicate idea that is inherent to Rome of bringing other people's ideas into the into the company um, and having that help inform what we want to do. And so we went on tour to California and the Pacific Northwest, predominantly, and maybe a little bit in the Midwest. And actually a separate tour here where we got together with some shops at Ragged Mountain um, in uh, New Hampshire. And it was the process of here are some of our product ideas, here are some of our marketing ideas. Um, what do you guys as retailers think uh, about it? And so that first time we did it before we even, before the public knew much about Rome, we were um, engaging some retailers in that regard. And then Nate looks like, um, that was at Jay's house. Was that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of years later when we, and my most memorable part of that one, um, at our rep's house in Western Pennsylvania was we showed the live nude girls artifact graphic for the first time to retailers to get their idea and the, and the whole, you know, all the different retailers. And this would be like five or six or eight different retailers together in one location, giving feedback, not one retailer only. So four to six, eight different retailers in the room. We showed that graphic and everybody was like, fuck yeah, best artifact ever. We showed (coughs) our old wider board, the flag. We showed a graphic version for that. And one of the retailers was like, that's about as horrible as that graphic's ever been. <laughs> and that, and in the early years, the flag graphics probably weren't our strongest graphics. And so it was just an environment in where retailers could give their feedback directly to us on product and uh, marketing and sales type stuff. Where did the idea to engage the retailer at that level come from? Is that something that you saw that wasn't occurring at Burton? I don't know, Burton's, Burton's okay at it. I mean, well, I should have to step back. I mean, obviously, they have done it. We were part of it. But Burton <laughs> focused so much on the athlete, like, to a, to a fault, um, mm-hmm. I think. And I was designing boards at that point, and the boards were all designed around a size 8 foot. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at, if you're, you know, once you start making boots, you, real, you, you know pretty quick that the average boot size in America is 10 and a half. So the average rider's got a bigger foot, but... The average team rider is size eight. And so I think they did, you know, they, that, that worked really well early, early days. Um, and maybe they were a little slower on the uptake there. Um, and then back to our original point, the rest of it, the rest of the industry, the rest of the primary players were ski brands. And the ski brands really didn't care very much. They, they didn't care about the retailers from the perspective of you're going to buy our skis. And by the way, you're getting 20%, there's going to be your board order. And so I don't think they cared necessarily. So I don't really think a lot of brands were at that time, including Burton, focused on the retailer. And, um, yeah, it may or may not be true for Burton, but um, yeah, yeah, I think. I think where we were coming from as we evolved our idea, you know, in this 
pretty much in this office that we're sitting in right now. Um, I sat here, which um, has later become other people's offices, and Paul sat right through that window right there. Um, there's a window between these two offices. Oh, yeah. It's a strange little thing. But when we were in this building trying to get it going, uh, not having had anybody working with us yet, not having any other employees yet, and not having um, not paying ourselves anything, as we fleshed out the idea of Rome more specifically, eventually the idea of the syndicate became a central, central idea. Um, and for us, the two of us, it was to be more expansive of the idea of rider-driven, right? Because the whole rider-driven tagline by then, 1999, 2000, had been pretty well used, abused, you know, overused probably. Um, and so we didn't want to just do the same thing as that. Um, and as Paul said, for most brands, rider driven equated to being athlete driven, right? And so the syndicate idea was to expand that because having us both worked in product development and testing, we knew there were a lot of, and having been in snowboarding since the mid eighties, early eighties, we knew there were a lot of other snowboarders out there that who had really valid ideas. Um, and so, yes, we were going to include our athletes in the process and they are, you know, Bjorn or Stala or Alec these days or Casey Nefis pushing the original idea of the artifact yeah. on the brand, right? That was his brainchild that then Paul and another guy took and ran with. So the athletes are definitely a key part of the syndicate, but it isn't the end of the story, right? This, the idea of the syndicate was to bring in, Local dudes who you don't ever know about or hear about, um, uh, shop people, our reps, you know, our reps are heavily, heavily involved, um, in the brand and always have been in, in the brand and helping make product decisions particularly. Uh, but the retailers and the shop kids who work for the retailers, you know, a lot of those dealer councils, the goal was to not only get the owner of the shop there, but to also get some of the staff there, the ones that are on the floor, you know, cause it's not rocket science, right? If, if we have a chance to talk to people who are on the front line of talking to everyday snowboarders, their ideas are going to be important ideas in the mix of all of these ideas. And so the dealer council really is just a subset of the syndicate idea of let's involve as many snowboarders in this brand from as many different walks of life within snowboarding as we possibly can and listen to them and try to distill all that information down. From my point of view, as being on the sales floor at that point, and wow, I just met the owners of Rome Snowboards, and we sat down and talked and had beers, and, and you know, I had this. I understand that company, and I'm backing that company 100. I'm going to sell the shit out of that company while I'm on the sales floor. I don't know if that was part of the strategy as well, but that's part of the buy-in that you got from me, and I would imagine other shop employees. Uh, just by making that interaction. Right, right. No, no other brand was doing that. I mean, a sales manager might come by and visit the shop, but you're not going to hang out and party with the owner of the, right, right. <laughs> the company. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the relationship building thing is definitely part of it, right? We're not, we're not going to say that that wasn't any part of it. But again, to hear that a graphic is good or a graphic is bad from the people that are going to sell it, that's, it's important. that's straight up important on its own. Yeah. You know? So I won't try to gush too much, but I've written... <clears throat> more room boards in my lifetime now than any other board um, and the agent specifically more so than any other board I mean it's been the Swiss Army knife for me and I just want to say thank you it's a fucking <laughs> awesome board it's been a huge it's crazy but it's been a huge part of my life nice. like something that you guys have made well that's Paul right? yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's Paul not me I'm, I'm more like you I'm the user of that board and Paul's the designer <laughs> of that board so yeah, that board's that that, that board's got a, a super rich history, and it is the backbone of kind of our product story. And uh, quickly on it, you know, that was one of the initial thoughts where we were. I had been designing boards for much smaller feet, and that was one of the things we were watching snowboarding change. Um, I don't know if you remember the time, but knowing Jay. Smith probably had a lot of you. Half pipe was part of his sure. big part of his life. Half pipe was like pipe jocks were everywhere in the in the in those days, and it was transitioning from pipe riding. Every board has to have a ton of side cut, super stiff, really narrow, quick edge to edge, to 
that's not how I ride. Right. And um, so that board, the agent specifically, all our boards did this, but the agent particularly was addressing what we saw as riding in those in those early 2000s and slightly wider, which, you know, at, up at that point, they were actually considered, probably most companies are mid-wide boards, but mm-hmm. we're in the 250 to 254 waist width, which is still a modern waist width because feet haven't gotten bigger. Um, and it was targeting riding that, all of us did around the mountain and we didn't just ride half pipe or park or powder. We rode everything and the whole mountain was um, freestyle oriented free riding, I guess. But. The other thing that I feel that you guys have done unique um, on the product front is, and especially you keep making this analogy to the ski companies, they'll have a, a $400 board and it's going to be the stiffness, the 420, 450, 500. It's, it's a stiffness equals price game. Um, you guys have broken away from that multiple times from my point of view and tell me if I'm wrong, but I mean, the Katana bindings that I'm riding now, it's the most expensive binding, but it's definitely not the stiffest binding, right. but it's 1000% worth, worth it. It's the most comfortable binding I've ever ridden in my life. And I'm just used to having this mindset, okay, if you're going to pay for the most expensive thing, it's the stiffest thing. That's what other companies do. You guys seem to do well, no, let's just build the right thing for this type of snowboarding, and we'll see how much it costs, and, and that'll be the price, mm-hmm. which is totally different than what everyone else does. They're, they're building this different model. It's, uh, thanks for the observation. It's definitely a frustration on some points <laughs> when you're going into meetings and people are like, yeah, but this one should be stiffer and that one should be softer. You're like, why? <laughs> why? Well, that customer at that price point, and as soon as you tie... I think probably where we first kind of evolved that thought was when we were working on boots. Um, Josh was primary boot tester and boots very much and sort of still to this day do follow that more expensive is stiffer. And I like a softer boot. Josh is kind of a medium boot, but we had guys that were at the time, you know, half pipe riders that were tweaking super hard riding stiff boots. There was no connection to, it, it came down to a personal preference, and that's when I think we distilled the thought, like, you know, f- that flex in boots specifically is a personal preference. Mm-hmm. There's no real price stratus justification, and that certainly could transfer over to boards very easily. Um, and then the primary drivers of, of costs are not stiffness right. of a board. I can make a super expensive board soft or stiff. It doesn't cost a, an iota more. So there is no actual product cost justification for it. So there is no, I mean, I think it's the, the leap that the consumer who wants to pay more wants a stiff board, I think. And if you just say that, it, it doesn't bear scrutiny, right? It's like, that doesn't make any sense. I want an expensive board because I want it lighter. I want it snappier. Or I just like spending more money on something because that's kind of my thing. Um, so yeah, we, we have tried to avoid it. We try to make the best product for somebody and that includes price and flex and design. So, and graphic. Yeah. So let's back up to year one, year two, the marketing for Rome. You guys had like this billion dollar budget and you're in all the magazines and on all the videos, right? Back no, that's not. How no, it went. that's not how it went. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, what, 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 what story have you heard? <laughs> early off, like, you know, I, I mean, I think I mean, just real, real quick. Before, I'll let Josh talk about that. Is his wheelhouse, but one of the things, whether it was dealer councils or reps' first visits to shops we'd start introducing the brand or the reps would, and and one of the first questions was, "Who's riding for you?" Mm. And we didn't. Josh talking about it, but we didn't have big name, high price riders, or we did have great riders, but we didn't have people that anybody necessarily thought was going to drive sales through. And so it forced us to have a different conversation. And that's kind of what we wanted anyway. Sure. Let's talk. Well, okay. We'll talk about that in a minute, but we're going to talk about this first. Yeah. So, you know, when we, when we did launch convert, you know, contrary to the giant budget, um, we certainly tried to get raise enough money to have a giant budget, but that did not happen. Um, and so when we launched in November, December of 2002, we had enough money to carry us for a certain amount of time, which was not a very long period of time. Um, and so we really didn't have robust budgets at all. And so we rolled, we, we took the brand to, to the trade shows and got our reps and got distributors all over the world. 
that happened pretty quickly. Um, but we still didn't have much money to spend um, until we started a couple of years of building the brand, building the sales, and raising some more money um, uh, in between 2000 and 2004. But in 2002, 2003, that first summer before we, uh, before you saw the first Rome stuff at retail, we actually didn't have any money to advertise at all. Um, and so that forced us to be more creative. And um, we, I think the dealer council was part of that. It's like, okay, what's one way to go out there and start talking to people about who we are? And we'll mm-hmm. do it face to face. And then, you know, Paul and I had uh, kind of humorously interviewed Shepard uh, Ferry to, to do art for us early when he had a, f- a firm with Dave Kinsey in San Diego. We actually met him um, and he was just starting to blow up. Uh, and in the conversation with him, which we eventually didn't have budget to use him, um, but, uh, you know, he talked about his um, using wallpaper paste to put up big posters in public. This was in the summer before we launched. So the summer of 2002, we hadn't launched yet. Um, but that conversation with him was like, wait, if we don't have any money, we can go put up advertisements on our own with a printer and, and wallpaper paste. And so sure enough, that first winter, the first eight years of Rome, probably certain reps, the Northwest guy, the, the California guy who's still with us, John Graham, um, myself, some other in-house people, you know, would actively go out at night in, in certain areas, in snowboard areas, Stratton Mountain during the U.S. Open, for example, or during SIA, um, or in Mammoth, because Mammoth was such a big scene back then, um, people would put up wallpaper pasted posters as forms of advertisement. And that was before we had like a magazine budget. But then in that next summer, in the summer of, 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 of 03, um, right before we, our stuff finally got to stores, um, we were in this position where, like, we don't have any money to advertise in a magazine. So what are we going to do? And um, this this kid, Captain Al, uh, um, uh, East Coast Bostonian uh, snowboarder with a very unique sense of humor, wanted to intern with us. And so he came up and talked, and we eventually decided to make our own magazine and advertise ourselves in our own magazine, which was called X the Magazine. And we shipped it to every store that got a Rome order, and it made a, several issues a year for about six or eight years. And SIA issue would be a big issue, but then the back, the retail issue would be a big issue. And, um, you know, it was a satirical magazine for the most part. Uh, and, but it was our first advertisement because we couldn't advertise. And then we advertised in Heckler magazine for the first year with a booming budget. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we were not in Transworld or Snowboarder that first year. Uh, and then, like I said, we, we did find some more fundraising between 03 and 04 and our sales started to generate their own money and we were able to eventually, you know, go to spread ads and trans world and, and snowboarder, um, um, and have that more traditional approach. But for the first three or four years, um, it was definitely a non-traditional approach. And, uh, and then that continued on. They overlapped a lot. You know, when we started making any means as a video and started having bigger ad budgets, Exa magazine and uh, postering still existed. They, they existed side by side. So many funny thoughts for me there, you know, bringing back the magazine and reading that. And it was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of humor in there for sure. But uh, one, did you guys make a sticker at one point or some stickers or maybe additions to road signs? Like a hula hoop that would go around the, the, the walk guy? We didn't do a hula hoop sticker. We might have tried to do one that went with that guy. I feel like Jason... Issa did, didn't they? Didn't Issa do one? Could have been. I feel like Jason Smith gave us some Rome stuff that we ended up drinking a lot at the bar, me and my buddy Paul Horning, who's on the podcast from time to time, and then putting these Rome stickers that I thought were Rome stickers onto the road signs near the bar, and they stayed there in our our little town for a long time. (laughs) Our biggest stickering addition, I would say, to you know snowboard marketing was... Um, climbing lift towers and putting them up on lift towers yeah. at nighttime. You know, that happened um, at Mount Hood. Um, the first couple of years of Mount Hood happened at Kirkwood in 
when we did our first dealer council, we had a, a stop at Kirkwood, and after the dealer council was over, um, pretty drunk, you know, um, myself and the our California rep when climbed some lift towers and uh, it happened at Stratton. There were ones that lasted for like 12 years at Stratton yeah. from pre-US Open um, hits that were done, right? We'd go down a couple of days before the US Open, um, climb some lift towers, put up stickers, and then you'd go there like eight years later, like, God damn, that sticker is still there, right? Wow. So that's no more of the sticker stuff no that I remember. Because right? you're scared too, or you're locking your arm around that 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 ladder up there and trying to not have your legs shaking and think, God, I wish I had like a climbing harness to, to like relax up here. Um, cause, um, you know, if you like adrenaline and the end of the day is pretty fun, but, um, it was scary at times, you know, it's, it's very, very sure. Very. <laughs> uh, the other thing from marketing that, um, I've seen Rome do very, very well. You guys almost are responsible for the original meme from my point of view. You've taken, huh any little aspect of snowboarding and just broken it down into four or five words and put it under an image and it just resonates with people, right? This has been an ongoing uh, thing in your marketing programs and print and now online and, and Instagram and all the others for, for many years. Was that calculated? When do you first remember doing that? You know, just little different things like the hike. It's always worth the hike and, and those sorts of right. things. No, I don't think it's calculated, and um, I don't, I'd be surprised if we invented the idea of a meme. Um, I don't know. I think it's just seeing imagery and trying to distill it down to its fundamental idea. The first one that comes into mind is a picture that we had in our first summer, and we didn't have very many pictures, of Matt, our rider, Matt Downey from California, riding, and it looks like they rebuilt it this year. I saw a picture of it the other day the big American flag rail at Snow Summit or Big Bear, right? Um, we had a picture of him board sliding it probably. Um, and I forget what we tagged in our, in our website that first summer was just that image with a link to email us, right? So there was no product on it. It was just an image of him on that rail. We were and it said, that God that. bless snowboarding, I think is what we put on it. Right? <clears throat> it kind of bummed some people out, but, but, um, uh, we, I think that's probably the first time we took an image that spoke to us a certain way and just put simple words on it like that. So that's probably the first time. So that would have been the summer of 03, um, right when we were about to deliver again. Uh, and had a very crude uh, website. Gotcha. So you guys have known each other for a really long time, at least from college, and worked together. Have you had to work on your relationship? Have there been tense moments? You know, has it been tough to deal with this guy or, or vice versa? <laughs> oh, no! This, well, I, I was going to mention this. This window was never boarded up so early yeah. days. It was, yeah, we, I mean, it's 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 tough. I think, um, I don't want to speak for Josh on it, but there were definitely a few years where the pressure of the business and the, the stress of working with somebody, I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said where it's like a marriage and there's a ton of tension um, and you're working with your arguably your best friend, right? We used to hike, ride, climb, bike, like everything together. And then there was a few years where we didn't need to be in each other. We're at work yeah. and we'd leave. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think one thing through those, even through those, those tough years for me anyway, was I couldn't imagine getting in business with somebody and that you didn't really know on the level that I knew Josh and, like your monkey mind would start, I don't know, is he embezzling? Is he doing this? Like all this stuff could have started and that never for me propagated beyond, you know, if I see him again, I'm going to punch him in the face. Like it didn't go to the, the, the deep set fear and the trust was so foundational that, I mean, I don't know how you start a business with someone that you don't, if, if unless everything's just going swimmingly, right? If you have any challenges and you don't trust that person, um, I, I can't even imagine it must just tear it apart. But on that, just to wrap that up, you know, there was a, a year or so and we actually have a great board of advisors and one of our advisors is a management coach. And um, we ended up going to visit with him for a few six, seven month period. Sure. And he wasn't like, he wasn't like a counselor. He wasn't, he just sat us down and talked about everything not specific about the tension. And somehow through that process, things just, 
work themselves out and um that anyway for me and then since that's three to six years ago right yeah, five, four, five five, years ago. yeah i mean it was that, that's my like yes there's a lot of tension could manage through it it was tough but then since then it's been back to we're on the same page for most everything um we have disagreements and everything but we're not it, it's, it's a little friendship weird. return and i would yeah. say uh, yeah you know um and yeah, it, Paul touched on marriage a little bit there. You know, I laughed during those, the harder years, you know, um, you know, uh, I was like, I don't want two marriages in my life. Right. But I, I've given myself two marriages in my life at the right. end of the day. Right. You know, um, and w- Paul and I had been so close as friends and, and done a lot of stuff where there was a ton of trust required before Rome. You know, we, 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 went to Mount Washington quite a bit in the winter time, right? Not just in the springtime and, you know, back country road there together um, where, you know, just the two of us kind of depended on each other in a, at times hostile environment. Mount Washington's pretty nasty, you know, place. And so those kind of things. And so there was just a, a deep friendship. And then when the stresses of Rome and the ego bullshit of, 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 of starting a business, um, you know, they fuck shit up at times. Right. And, um, yeah, about four or five years ago, as Paul said, after talking through some stuff, I think it really came down to taking a step to start doing fun shit together again yeah. and not just it be fuck I'm with you at work and we're not always getting along and all that kind of stuff. And then going our separate ways always afterwards. And for me, my memory is it started more with mountain biking in the summertime one summer. It's like, as instead of just doing it separately constantly or me yeah. not me not doing it very much, um, when I kind of got back into it, um, it was, okay, where are you going? And then we just started doing that more naturally, and then that kind of came back in the winter to, to the mountain, right? And so there were years where, yeah, we didn't go to the mountain a whole lot together at all together, right? And now it's it's normal, right? It's common. Like, are you going? Are you not going? I mean, we skinned together this morning. Um and so it's just back to being normal that way, which is, you know, infinitely, infinitely better than it was Good. in the difficult years. Um, so, yeah. It, it, I mean, it, you talk to any two people that start business together. Um, it, it's not, you know, they're, they're difficult moments, obviously, right? Yeah. Unless you're like one of those couples who just seem to get along with them easy, right? They kill each other. That's not Paul, that's, right. that's, not, that's not Paul and me. You know, <laughs> I, you know, my brother and his wife, I look at my brother and his wife, and I'm like, holy shit, those people never, they don't look like they ever disagree about anything. <laughs> that's I not mean, me that in my life, that's not, that's that's not me and Paul. It's like an act behind closed doors and just like tear into each other. I don't know. I, I think I see some people where it's just easier, you know, and they're the lucky people, but... Yeah. But uh, but businesses have shit tons of stress to them, and uh, but yeah, it's it's fortunately we worked through that phase, and uh, we're we're close again, both um, uh, personally and uh, and on a business level. You mentioned that you skinned. Did you find yourself like um, managing stress better, like in that in that relationship? Like if you had to work through like with someone else. And if something go well, did you like evaluate how you manage your stress? I mean, do we do we transfer the skills of having worked together through it to other to other relationships, kind of thing? Or um, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, did that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I yeah, I think we both probably matured in that regard over fifteen years, but um. You know, back on, you know, with with each other, for me, at the end of the day, it's so much easier to disagree when we fundamentally get along than it is to disagree when we fundamentally don't get along, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, when we fundamentally don't get along, the, dis- the small yeah. disagreement, it, people take their defensive <clears throat> positions so much fucking quicker. Yeah. Whereas... Right. It's a proxy war. It's right. not, it's exactly. not, you're not arguing about the issue, you're arguing about... It's another it. drop in the real... The heated did this bucket. Right. <laughs> right. You guys mentioned that you skinned together this morning, and you've really created a fucking cool culture here. Like, it, there's a lift that opens at 8 a.m. right down the street of Stowe, and you encourage, from my understanding, people to snowboard before work. Uh, how does how does that structure work for everyone? I mean, for me, this would be a place I'd want to come and work and snowboard before work and, and stay late to work on projects, but, you know, is there a very defined 
policy around there. So. What was that, Adrian? Oh, he's asking if I was applying for a job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this I'm you're, not, un- you're not even recording this. This is an interview. I'm unemployable. <laughs> But is there is there like a, a snowboarding policy? How, how does how does the culture? There's no. I mean, there's no. It's an understanding. It's not a policy, right? I mean, literally, we try to schedule generally our meetings. Everybody is pretty weekly meeting gets get scheduled after ten. Mm-hmm. You know, we know you can have even if it's not a great day. You know, you can get a couple of runs in and then get in here. And I think it helps. It helps everybody. Everybody's closer to the sport and enjoys it. And then on powder days, everybody's like texting move meetings back or on, is it just an understanding and you know if we haven't had you know there's been a couple exceptions with all the employees coming through but i would say you know, whatever 95 percent of the time everybody gets it and doesn't abuse it and just appreciates it and uh you know, hopefully you get to make some turns with them too right it's yeah 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 I would, I would say that you know when we were deciding where we wanted to base the company that definitely was a major discussion between me and Paul before we hired anybody, right? So it kind of started before Rome started of like, we want to be able to snowboard before work and still get whatever we need to get done, done. And so we want to be close to a lift. We're about 25 minutes, half hour from a lift here. Um, and the lift has to open pretty early. And so snow opens at eight, like you said, and it's pretty easy to integrate it in. And we want... We want people who to work here to want to do it. We're more concerned with the people who don't want to do it, right? Sure. It's like how into it are they? You know, are they going to stay? In, are they going to stay dedicated to it? Um, if some people are riding a ton and getting their stuff done, that's ideal to us. But yeah, there's no, there's no. It's an understood policy that you're free to do it as long as you get done what you need to get done. And I'll also say that in the non-snow times of year, and in general this is a place where people work hard, right? And so if they work a lot of hours in the spring, summer, and fall, then we don't really give a fuck if they don't work 40 hours a week in the winter. We know it balances out. We know it balances out more in the, probably in the favor of them working hard, right? So if it's, if they're, if it gets good, like it did a couple of times this year and people put in 30 hour weeks, yeah, we're fine with that because we know we, we know people are, are getting done what they need to get done. I, I retract that. I am going to apply for a job. <laughs> we, uh, I talked to um, a couple of my friends and we put out um, some posts on Facebook for people to ask uh, listener questions. And, and one that came up recurring, and, and it's probably the same thing, like you've told us a million times, but um, the, the Burton rumor. I know you guys have addressed it in the past, but do you have any direct involvement <laughs> financially? Like, which, which burden room? <laughs> financially or otherwise? Like with the burden. That, that the- <laughs> you know, that, that rumor, we, Paul and I probably have not addressed that rumor in many, many, many years. Um, but yes, early on for the first five or six years, you know, it came up constantly. And, and people, people that worked in stores, there were some people of the shop staff there's always one or two guys that might have believed it right um but no no we we don't have any connection with them we both work there which i think that is probably why the rumor started um and paul worked there for like 10 years i worked there for like five years um and you know we did we did a lot of stuff well early on right and i think that probably fueled the rumor right that they had some that we had some kind of backing but yeah, if if you follow what we've done and 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 how we've uh, um, not we you know have stretched a lot of dollars and not spent wildly, um, and if you talk to anybody inside here, um, it's pretty obvious that there's no connection. And if there were, it would be like the biggest kept secret between me, Paul, and Jake that anybody's ever known because right. yeah. nobody else has come in close contact with Rome whether it's the graphic design intern five years ago and earlier, or sorry, before 2011, um, they would work all nighters here <laughs> to get done, to get stuff done. College interns in graphic design, there were several that uh, participated in the, the all nighter here. You know, it's the culture of it. It's just, yeah, it's not true. <laughs> I think, yeah, that's true. And, and uh, I think how we made our mark on the market pretty early and that's, summed up to what we did um, 
quite frankly, the internet was mm -hmm. just starting to really show its power. So there was definitely a boost we got from that. Starting five years earlier would have been a much different situation. Um, and I, I got to believe some of it had to do with, like, if you're starting out and you're splitting off from a company, um, there's probably a lot of people that start companies and then just shit talk the other company. And, and I don't think, you know, us and the core group here have ever... We don't we don't talk shit about any brands. Right. I, I I mean we don't we 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 don't. I and think so it's a there might have been like well if you're not shit talking them. Well, I will I will say that if you read Exxon magazine, <laughs> that's um, not us. They, <laughs> they, they would have had plausible denial. <laughs> and uh, there, there was two main contributors to Exxon magazine, Captain Al and myself. And um, Captain Al's contributions were the, if you look at it, um, if you read the issues, which most people don't have access to, you can go to Salty Peaks and maybe ask to read some because I know he kept them all. Dennis, yeah. Um, but Al's contributions were more interesting, onion-esque commentaries on um, snowboard cultural things, right? My contributions were um, satirical um, pieces on other brands that went by pseudonyms and a couple of brands were off limits it didn't ever get touched right but burton was not one of those brands right we were we through channels like XM magazine you know we, we we weren't always super friendly to burton so if there was a financial relationship between them and us it would have been under the understanding of, hey, you guys got to act like assholes to us, <laughs> but we still own you. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, and they yeah. kind of act like assholes to us in return uh, and in other ways, too. So if, if, if you're anywhere close to the relationship for those first eight or nine years of, of, of rum, you know, it wasn't friendly either direction. So the fact yeah. that they would own us and then it'd be unfriendly mutually... Yeah, it's kind of a weird, weird could, rumor. Could you say that it's friendly now? Uh, we're friendly with people who work there, but we don't have any relationship with Jake, right? I don't. I, don't, I never see Jake at Stowe. I don't know if Paul does, but so um, traveling every now and then and smiling. It would, it would be. Hey. We would say hi, cool. but it's not. But we don't. We There's don't no have. Reason. We don't have any relationship with anybody in upper management there. I mean, John Lacey, I'll say hi too if I see him at SIA or something. Yeah. And he's he's a good. He's not. He's a good guy, and we have friends. This guys in town here that Paul coaches with that are pretty senior there. Um, and so Paul coaches with this one guy who's pretty darn senior there. And I saw a couple of guys in the mountain the other day and it's friendly, you know, like the testers there, Mark Bradsell and some of their people there, you know, we're perfectly friendly with, um, but the businesses were kind of unfriendly to each other for sure. a while. Sure. Um, so, so my buddy, Jeff Martinez, and he's, um, I'll be I'll be kind to Jeff and say he's a full figured man. He says, "Give me that 157 with a 290 waist width." And he's talking about the powder division. He's writing the the one in the 40s now. I forget what size it is. 142, uh, 48, 48, right? And you know, ten and a half foot. So what does he want? He wants that. He knows I've told him about what's coming in the future, okay. and he knows that there's a 157 powder division coming in the future. But he wants it in that 290 waist width. Oh. Again, which it's a volume play yeah, on that yeah, board. Yeah. It's almost like a surfboard right. mindset. So that would basically be a huge volume board. Is that something that's even even possible? Two ninety waist width. Yeah. What's the waist width on the on the one forty eight? Two two ninety. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's it's possible. It's hard to get a lot of side cut into those boards just due to press width limitations. I mean, going much wider than I mean, it'll be three thirty. Um, but there's also the real reality of it's going to become far less versatile. It's going to become great in the perfect conditions where you can actually angulate it. But if you get that on a groom slope, it's going to be, regardless of your foot size, it's going to be difficult to get up on edge. Okay. Um, but it's possible for sure. Um, well, that's what he likes about it so much. Now he lives near me and we ride this little, little hill by our house and we ride it 99% of the time. Uh -huh. rumors you know right. it's just something right. that'll lay trenches but once you yeah if you if in good conditions there is a point where you you can get it up on edge and it holds an edge because the leverage is so high that you can just euro carve the thing yeah i mean we got a guy here banana hands hey, you ride the, the moon the tail on rumors a lot yep. yeah, yeah. yeah yeah smooth groomers anything chopped up i start to not like it yeah. but i'll ride it with my kids when we're out grooming and just do stuff so yeah you can tip and tip and turn it it's um yeah, just this is possible. But we do, as I was saying, this guy we have one of our testers here who's six four plus or minus. Two size two forty, right? Two forty. And he's a big dude and he has 
since two years has been riding the 148 as a daily driver. Yeah. Like every day he's riding it. Powder, groomers, ice, and um, and makes it look like it works. So. Mini hammers. So another listener question, Averin Lefebvre, who's also the angry snowboarder, mm-hmm. um, wants to know if you're going to bring back a wide mod or wide mod rocker. Mm. There have been a few people asking for it, um, for sure. We're um, looking, our new line list doesn't have a doesn't have a mod in the line, but it's got a board similarly, let's say, construction-wise, not mm-hmm. quite as expensive. Um, but we've got some more expansion of our, our wide boards coming next year for sure. Cool. Um, Daniel Gertie says, he asked a lot of good questions here. Let me just pull a couple of them. I don't think we, and we've covered some of them a little bit. Um, this is one that I had and that I think about quite often is, how do you view the yearly retail cycle of snowboard hard goods? Is there a need to reevaluate the season to season model of snowboard retail? Yeah, that's a topic that comes up a lot in, you know, serious conversations internally, also with retailers, you know, you know, most recently for me last year at our lodge in Europe, talking to European retailers and in Sully comes back from SIA meetings where the topic is talked about at an industry level, you know, and trying one specific idea is trying to shift deliveries later and hold price longer which we're all for you know if if that was feasible and the thing that the thing that i think we all struggle with and it's a reality that is hard to change is that we can't uninvent christmas right the 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 on sale nature that happens with christmas shopping or post christmas shopping right is just something in in western culture europe or here that is really hard to get around. You know, it's really hard to say, okay, in this one industry, the retailers are going to stay on high price until March, as they should, right? Because in, in a normal sporting goods industry, we would hold price, or retailers, that is, would hold price until now, March, right? And then maybe April is the off-price time. But through the winter, when it's still snowing in Boston once in a while and still snowing in New York or... The people of Tahoe, the people of San Francisco know that Tahoe gets a big old March 15th dump that, that, that retail prices would still be, you know, you know, full retail. Um, but early in our cycle, Christmas happens, right? And that every retailer in America goes off price it's the next fire. day. Yeah, and, and it's early in our cycle, right? It's early in winter. It's really screwed up. Most, um, most places. And how to fix that? I, don't, I, 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 I've thought about it a bit, not, a, not a, in, inadvertent, not, not a ton, but it's hard to consider how to deal with that reality of all retailers in, in Western culture going off price after Christmas. So that, yeah, on the East Coast, think about how good the snowboarding is pr- prior to December. Like it, it's it's good when you're in certain areas, but it just isn't really happening. Right. It's not February and March, right? Right, and those yeah. are the months where you're you're in the sweet spot, and at retail, stuff's going off price. I do think some of it. I would go ahead, AJ. I would just say that I mean, part of that is like the racking patterns too. Like, I mean, we got so much snow this year in snow, and this is probably like the best time to snow. I, I would say like March, April, May is like the best time to snowboard in general, like the most snow, warmest weather and people just like stop coming, especially compared to like December, January when it's not, I don't think it's as good, you know, necessarily. And it's like, during that time, they're just like coming up. It's packed. It's whatever. And then now it's like, dude, this is the best time. Why aren't you guys here? Yeah, it's crazy. You know, you know? and they just they just don't think about it. Yeah, because their lives get on to warmer weather activities compared to us who live in yeah. mountains. Like you, you're in Tahoe, we're here, and it's it's still winter here, and and it usually is. I mean, yeah. Vermont can be wintry in April, and we can be kind of cold and not very warm in may here you know but people in boston or people in san francisco in terms of cities close to the two of us um their minds are going elsewhere but yeah i'll agree with you you know just yesterday um you know paul and i shared an instagram account called rome founders 
and um, we follow Chris Inglesman, uh, um, the old K2 rider slash uh, worked at Snowboarder Mag forever. And he, po- he yes- yesterday he posted, you know, I love a spring powder day at Snowbird. And, and it looks it looks amazing. And, and there was no tram line. Yeah. You know, if you know Snowbird, there's no tram line. And, and the same thing is true for us. Paul had last Wednesday morning where he had first down numerous lines that are done in 15 minutes um, on a normal powder day because it was crazy cold. And nobody really knew about it. It was like an eight-inch day that probably blew deeper in places. And Burlington didn't get anything. We didn't get anything here in Waterbury 20 minutes away. And so our spring powder days are by far the better ones. When nobody's there and and um, the snowpack is better too, right? The, the underneath snowpack is filled yeah. in as well. Yeah. So. So, yeah, we agree. Yeah, so this time of year is great snowboarding, but it gets great for those of us who are locals like yourself because nobody else is around, yeah. right? And if you go to, you know, I mean, Squaw obviously gets murdered out real quick like our mountain does, but, you know, you don't fight with as many people yeah. for it. Daniel asked another... Yeah, I mean... I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in, AJ. Daniel asked another really yeah. interesting question. It might be kind of thought provoking. Um, if you could change one long held tradition in the snowboard industry, what would it be? It's one of those ones where it's like, oh, I got to think about that for a second. What's what's my biggest problem in the snowboarding industry? And then do I really want to say that on a podcast? Right. <laughs> tradition. God damn. I don't know. Tradition in the industry. And maybe it's just the. Snowboarding's fun, and there's no great answer to that. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I think. I mean, the, the, you can change nutrition for the better too, is is make it more inclusive. I think. Uh, um, Rick Alden invited Josh and I up to Vail Pass around the trade shows um, six, seven years ago now. Yeah. And he just got together a bunch of. He just <clears throat> networked through a bunch of people he knew, industry. Um, Kind of company company founders is kind of how he limited it first, but you know he brought guys from SoCal and NorCal and um, and us and a few you know there's probably seven or eight nine or ten industry guys and it's a really cool setup he has um, with snowmobile access to great snow great lines and um, it was just awesome to be out with Terry K- Terry Kidwell was there that first year uh, that's right yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, to just be like. I, I don't remember who said it, but I'm sure a bunch of people said it. Probably Rick, most like, what a fucking great industry we work in, and just you know, they, that tradition has been lost. Where we, you know, we get together, and um, I don't know. I've only been to the Transworld Industry Conference once that they used to run, and you know, that sort of there's just so many factions, and people are so competitive that no one lets their guards down very often. Um, but M- more powwow type events, like yeah, Rob yeah. Kingwell's powwow. Um, where it is, um, everybody's having fun together and you're not a competitor, um, with each other. You're just riding each other's products for fun. You don't ride your own product at all. Um, as I told Rob a couple of times and Paul went a year, a better year than I did. I, I rode groomers at Jackson the year I went, but nonetheless, it was the best snowboard event I've ever been to in my life because it is a true communal experience of a lot of people that have been snowboarders, from the 90s or 80s or early 2000s on the younger guys, but a wide range of people that everybody knows how to snowboard, just a tent full of people. Um, so more things like that, you know, I think, as Paul said, this thing of Vail Pass by snowmobiles was people that all love snowboarding, getting together and doing it together. And so I think those kind of traditions, um, to grow those, I don't know if I'd call it a tradition to change, but one structural thing in the industry that I would like to see more change of, um, because my kids didn't benefit from it, my kids are 11 and 13, um, is better access to early snowboard instruction for kids, right? Because when my kids were little, still had a policy that 
um, there's barriers. <coughs> the resorts put in barriers to kids learning to snowboard that are ill-founded on bad science or or or, or bad theories. Sad. And like my kids weren't allowed to get an, a lesson at Stowe um, back in the early 2000s until they were six. And by then, I had taught them to snowboard, right? Um, and the terrain isn't really modified to um, to help camera. them learn, learn, right? You know, and and to give some props to um, Burton and and to and to maybe fuel the the rumor that they do actually own us. <laughs> um, is it when my kid was five? You know, he's eleven, so six years ago, the first time they ever built a snow riglet or whatever they call those things. Um, they had Ross Powers up, shown his gold medal, which was awesome. He's an awesome guy. And they had these four-foot-high features that my kid could ride down and then yeah. ride over a, a little um, kind of mini spine or um, come to a stop after riding down this hill on a flat surface without any further acceleration. And we did about a half hour there, and we went over to a lift, and he was making turns, you know, later that day as a five-year-old. And... Um, and for resorts to build out on more of that and to encourage three-year-olds to snowboard, you know, I am seeing more of it. I saw it this year at J Peak of families, but they were family run. It wasn't the resort doing it. I mean, you're seeing more in three and four-year-old kids doing it. And um, there are programs, our, 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 uh, our sales guy, Sully, who lives at Sugarbush or lives near Sugarbush and rides Sugarbush, um, they use hula hoops there to help um, small kids learn, and the kid gets to hold on to the hula hoop and, and change edges. Changing edge from heel to toe is obviously the hardest thing for a beginner to do, including little kids, and the hula hoop assists in that. For that to spread out to more resorts, um, not, only not just in America, when I was over at ISPO a month ago, a month and a half ago, um, I heard from two different Europeans that their kids were skiing because the ski schools said that it is bad for little kids' hips and knees to snowboard. You know, that it's physically bad for their knees and physically bad for their hips. And I'm like, that's just more that goddamn European ski instructor bullshit. Like, you have to be a ski instructor before you can be a snowboard instructor. Most of the American audience probably doesn't know that. But in most European countries, you got to be a ski instructor before you can be a snowboard instructor. And so there's all these structural barriers to prevent young kids from snowboarding, both probably bigger ones in Europe than there are here. But still... The resorts make it hard for kids to learn how to snowboard when they're little, when they're two, three, four, and then it becomes up to the parent only. And so that's something I would like to see change on the resort side is make it easier for a young kid to get into it. Um, and that we'll see that'll help, you know, just the overall snowboarding um, be healthier and, and grow. It's the last ripple of what you're going through and you were taking tests of <coughs> accepting snowboarding. Oh, yeah, the for sure. I mean, the fact that Stowe is not that conducive or supportive of snowboarding when they have a giant relationship with Burton is a testament to how, you know, stuck in their old ways most, not all, ski areas are with on, on this topic, right? Most ski areas are run by older skiers that are kind of stuck in their ways, and um, on this topic at least. Uh, and that goes for our mountain. You know, our mountain... You know, it's not super snowboard centric. And five years ago, if your kid had to be six to get a lesson, that's pretty screwed up. Yeah. And the terrain at Stowe is not conducive for it, as Josh said. They have a short little magic carpet. And it, what it does, it's a great stepping stone for skiers. These kids go on it three times maybe, and then they're up on the lift. And the trail that the lift services is kind of off camp or convex, and it's got some, like, and you remember your first day snowboarding, the trail had, the side of the trail had magnets and you're getting sucked towards yeah. the left side or the right side. And they need to have um, terrain for that. Whereas skiing, it doesn't affect them. And so they progress quickly up through the system. Whereas snowboarding, I had my kid, I had actually rigged up a recoiling leash and attached it to his back binding. Um, and that worked progressed him to a point but at some point it just inhibited him because i was i was steering the board yeah. um whereas yeah europe is a abysmal place from a instruction perspective but the terrain at almost every oh, yeah. little resort awesome. for learning is remarkable i mean it really is remarkable for it's predominantly as we discussed for skiers but 
wide open trails, perfect flat angles, obstacles, yeah. cones, tunnels, clowns. There's like everything except the clowns. The three year old kid ones. Love. <laughs> yeah, and they just they just want to engage that slope and. I haven't seen it here in the U.S. either. So yeah. the terrain isn't here, and then, as Josh was saying, the instruction doesn't seem to be, with the exception of a couple places, um, like this hula hoop technique uh, up at Sugarbush that I'm sure is at five or six other places. I think yeah. I've seen some videos. But it really makes it easier. And I don't know what it is. I think it's it has to come from management being, whether they're entrenched in skiing and don't care about snowboarding or whether they're entrenched in skiing and they don't like snowboarding or they just it's foreign to them and so they just sort of like we're doing what we have to do and that's it um you don't you, the kids don't have to ski first and that that idea needs to be broken down still so and yeah. that idea really drives a lot of people yeah you guys have mentioned europe a couple times and rome from my perception is really big in europe um and yeah, I know that there's been uh, different times roam houses over there and, and that you engage retailers over there as well. Um, where did uh, I don't, the words I'm coming up with are infatuation with Europe, but why, why did you focus on, on that zone? Well, you know, a couple, I mean, th that's an older question and the lodge is a, is a separate thing, um, but the lodge is our most modern um, European focus, you know, it's four years old now. Um, and maybe Paul will touch into that. But the 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 drive to 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 have we have a European office which we opened, I believe, in 06, 07, um, in Munich. Um you know, our desire to do that was just a natural evolution of how we were succeeding or not succeeding in Europe. And for our first, if that was 06, 07, so for our first four or five years we never had a German distributor. We couldn't find a German distributor that cared about snow or wanted a new brand. Um, we had Austrian distributors. We had French, just we had Swiss who did France as well. We had UK, we had Norway. A lot of these countries we had in our very first year, but we never had Germany. And, and we would go to ISPO to support the distributors. And, you know, along the way, um, you know, we as we got bigger and trying to take on more things, we started saying, okay, what if we just did this the way we do America, where we have reps, and in some of these countries we just have reps because of the EU, all one currency now, um, and uh, have an office here, and that way we can get German reps because we don't have a German distributor. And so it kind of was a natural evolution to, to become focused on it in that way. Um, and... Uh, we got German reps. We switched the French guys into reps out of the Swiss distributor. Eventually, our UK distributor turned into a rep, the same guy. Uh, same thing with the uh, Austrian guy. One of the reps of the distributor is our rep now and has been for most of those years since 07. Um, but I will also say that I'm infatuated with snowboarding in Europe. Um, you know, I, 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 before Paul talks, I'm going to be on the lodge a little bit. I'll say this. To, to all my friends and people that I meet that uh, um, if you have the free time and it's firing over there and it's and there's snow over there in terms of resort snowboarding not Alaska not included it, it's the best place to snowboard in the world given the type of terrain um, and the the number of resorts that spread people out if you go to the non um, famous places, you know, the, the place, and there's a million of them, right? It's not like, oh, there are only famous places here. No, there's the famous places that are the equivalent, like St. Anton's, the equivalent of Squaw or whatever. But around St. Anton, there's all these unknown places that the only people there are like Dutch tourists. Mm. And so the snow truly stays good all day long without a stress. Um, and some of the terrain is, like at Teen in France, where our, our reps currently live, uh, our reps are, are in Teen, and, you know, you can scare the shit out of yourself if you want to there inbounds. Um, and so it has a quality of terrain, and when they get snow, which they often do, they have a quality of terrain that just kind of, um, and lack of crowds in the powder, you know, compared to North America. American powder gets hammered out so quick, yeah. you know. Um, it's hard to, you get to go... Taos or Kirkwood, and I, I love Kirkwood, uh, or Western Canada. You know, Western Canada, Taos, Kirkwood, a couple other places to get away from the feeding frenzy on a powder day. 
Europe is all over the place in multiple different countries. And so, and then, like I said, you can get into super gnarly <laughs> type stuff and, and you're pretty easily right inside the mountains. Um, they're new mountains, right? They're very young mountains. And so as a result, they're shaped pretty awesomely. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of resource, ton of terrain. Um, the density is spread out. And even you were talking about making an analogy for St. Anton and comparing it to, where did you compare it to? Squaw Valley. Squaw Valley. Yeah, there's no comparison if you look at it on oh, the map. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I remember it's like, 10 times the size. Right. Wow. And so, but then there's smaller. But, they, but the heavies the, are all there trapped. Right. Out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the quote unquote, the air quotes, um, smaller resorts, like they rival, they're beyond Stuh, which is a fantastic mountain. But these tiny little nowhere resorts, and that's where we, you know, we're transitioning into the lodge. Dedumskoff is a tiny area. By I mean, why did you go to Dedumskoff? It's like because it's amazing, and no one else goes there. Right. Um, and it's you know when we we go there, I guess it's it's Gigi Ruff's home mountain, yeah. and you know you can really see why he rides the way he rides when you're looking at the terrain. Like oh, there's all these natural transitions and everything. and on a good snow day, like. It's it's amazing how few people you're competing with. I mean, you're competing with the crew we bring there. Right, right. <laughs> it's it. And it's frustrating. We, yeah, it's, and we've said this before and amongst ourselves, it's mm-hmm. it's our second home mountain. And for me and for Josh, we talked about it last year, it's like, it's the resort outside of, I guess you spend time in Jackson. I've never, I've never snowboard bummed um, and just lived at a resort. But it's the resort I've spent the most days on snow of any resort outside after snow. So it's yeah. our home. It's my second home mountain. We've never actually ridden there together, like me and so. Because we always the way we man up the lodge is we had the seniors and the junior U.S. Rome person goes on each group, and so we see each other in the airport, pass the keys to gotcha. our car, yeah. and we move on. So we actually haven't ridden there together, which is funny. Um, but it's and we talk about it like we've ridden it together. Like oh yeah, the line up there, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we know all the lines. We found the same terrain at this resort. But um, we've never actually ridden there. So, yeah, the lodge, real quick, is, you know, our answer to our trade show over there. At some point, um, mm-hmm. the effectiveness of ISPO was dwindling for us and expense was rising for us. And so we just made the decision four years ago to, you know, what, A, this is the most amazing place to snowboard. Um, we found a little lodge that we've been renting for four years now. Um and we bring retailers, European retailers in with their agent or their rep or their distributor. We bring U.S. guys there. We bring our guys from the Munich office there. And we have basically two to three day cycles where they come in. We eat with them. Um, we party with them. We snowboard with them. We rodel with them. We do. We have three days of just amazing time and at nights we do product uh, clinics and and presentations and we talk about product and then it inevitably after a few beers starts talking into like the challenges of the industry and new product ideas and so it's it's a it's the whole thing smashed into one it's a trade show it's um bonding with people it's networking with people it's product presentations it's product development brainstorms it's it's just everything and um it's an awesome experience, and uh, so yeah, it's been really effective for us. And recently, I would say it's become a marketing opportunity as well with social media. You know, I'm seeing it on social yeah. media. You're getting a leak of the new products. You, you know, you're getting a window into what these the what? retailers are experiencing. Right. I mean, I would say also, as Paul described, your average two day cycle there, especially when the snow is good. Um, you know, it is it is kind of like the the perfect expression of who we are as Rome, right? And, you know, as opposed to like a, an ad, right? You know, yeah, I, I run the marketing here and, and so I'm involved in making ads and an ad is an ad, right? You try to express who you are in an ad, but this is, an, this is two days or two days and three nights with a group of people where you, you just get to be, you know, who we are. And, and, it, and, and I'll say in relationship to that, it's like even when there's a, a bit of a language barrier, you know, the snowboarding becomes a language. Like last year, uh, I was there with the guys that are currently our French guy, our French reps. Um, they also own a store, uh, and, and they speak perfectly good enough English to, to, to communicate with, but it's not like super, super fluent where we could, you know, talk about politics or something very easily. Right. Um, 
and not that we really want to, but, um, but just, but they snowboard, they're amazing snowboarders, right? And so when you get a group of people together, like at the Jackson powwow, or when the certain retailers come to the Rome lodge in, in Austria and everybody can kind of like, you know, buzz on snowboarding at a similar level, right? It's, it's, it's an awesome experience, right? And you use, um, everybody riding together and, and like approaching the mountain in a somewhat similar way. Um, kind of the way Paul and I ride together. Paul, Paul's somebody who I can ride very easily with, right? I can read him. I know what he's going to do. We, 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 be long before Rome, we, we ride in a way where you just understand what the other person's mm-hmm. doing. And so when you find groups of people you have from other countries at the Rome Lodge, it's a pretty awesome thing. Yeah, you don't have to communicate verbally. Right. It's like, okay, I know where this guy's going to go after a couple runs with him. And I know I can ride this close to him without, you know, even though we're back to back without concern of us exactly. running into each other. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But that said, the French guys, I rode through the park with them a few times this last trip. and They're, they're absurd. They're absurd. Yeah. <laughs> they're, you know, early 40-year-old guys throwing 720s. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, what the hell? What the I rode powder with them, right? So yeah. I, was more, I was more in their league, yeah. Um, and, but... It's fun to, and then they weren't our reps last year when I was with them, and then they became our reps in this in the subsequent year. Um, but yeah, that connection through snowboarding made it pretty easy to say, "Oh, they, we, we this is an opportunity to have them as our reps." Sounds perfect, right? Cool, cool. AJ, these guys have to jump for a call here pretty soon, and you've been really quiet. I know I've been in your situation. Usually, it's the opposite where uh, I'm the one being piped into the room full of people. But um, do you have any any Question, final questions or thoughts or anything that you want to voice or um, I wanted to mention like I know it's brought up like, like kind of like the disconnect from like skiing companies I just wanted to see what your um, opinion like do you think it's weird that people still I don't know it seems like people support like the ski companies seem cool, you know, brands like Solomon and like K2. And I, I consider Ride a ski company because they like own my K2. Mm-hmm. And it seems weird, like, snowboarding so ready to like, all oh, these are like the cool brands. And I've always thought like, they can like the whack ones to me, you know. And like, a snowboard company that makes snowboards is like, the, that's the brands that people should be like, buying fully. You know what I mean? Um, and I was wondering, like, what your opinion was, or you like, I mean, we had like the spray tears stickers, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> what? What? But, <laughs> and, and and we, you know, in our in one of our um, in our marketing campaigns a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, you know, we we you know made the point a little bit more explicitly that was implied in a lot of earlier stuff of. You know, we do feel that um, snowboard companies should be owned by snowboarders. Um, that's something that we've always right. felt. And, you know, that's um, kind of something that we, we've always believed and we still believe. Um, but, you know, I, I don't really want to, you know, badmouth other brands specifically um, or a category of brands too much. And I know there's some really great people that work at some of those brands, good, good snowboarders, um, um, people that have been snowboarding for a long time have worked at a lot of those brands. Um, you know, Hava Fernandez worked at Solomon for a long time and he helped edit any means here one summer and, and he, he works at Stance now, but you know, the people like Hava in the industry who I have a lot of respect for, um, uh, but above them, you know, the thing that we, I think have always had an issue with a little bit more is the people that make the final decisions, right? The real, the CEOs yeah. of those yeah. parent corporations, you know, Jarden before and which owns K2 and, and Ride and then Rubbermaid now that owns K2 and Ride. Um, or the, the, the true decision makers of Nike when they were in the boot world. Um, those people generally don't give a shit about snowboarding. The, the people that are making the final, final, like monetary decisions about what direction those, co- those large corporations are taking. Those people really don't give a shit about snowboarding. And in some cases, there may be, you know, skiers that are, you know, that are, have hostile ideas towards snowboarding. And it's when those people, um, are making decisions for snowboarding or profiting off of snowboarding 
those people upstream from the people on the um, front line. Um, yeah, we, I'm not a big fan of that, right? You know, why, why should people who not care about snowboarding or who may be hostile to snowboarding be involved in the business of snowboarding? Um, so it's kind of a, it's a difficult topic, right? Because the people that are all the snowboarders working for those brands are really cool people. The people that make the final decisions above them, as we saw with Nike getting the plug pulled on it, and the people that were the snowboard staff having to go elsewhere for their jobs, etc. Um, it's the guys that pulled the plug. You know, those are the guys that are the fundamental decision makers of those brands. And the question is, should they or should they not be, you know, impacting snowboarding? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know you were going to go to the Nike one without, I was going to bring that up. But like, I agree, we don't like to, you know, there's not, I know people at all those companies and we have friends at a lot of those companies. Um, but when you kick it upstream to the management, <clears throat> it, it gets to be a little more questionable. And the Nike examples is perfect, right? They just decided, somebody's like, why are we doing this? It's a rounding error. Snowboarding's, you know, snowboarding's not giving us the return we wanted, so let's get the hell out. Um, and is that good for snowboarding? I mean, it was good for a few people for a few years, um, but it probably did ultimately a lot more damage here and there. And um, if they're not willing to work through the challenging times, like, you know, what, what are they doing there? Uh, they're, they're, and that it's a free market, and you know it really just comes down to what consumers are willing to do. Do they care or don't they care? I mean, it's like it's like organic food. Are we going to pay for organic food? I don't care. I do care. Um, at some point, you have to make a decision for yourself and what's good for the world and what your view, your worldview is. So, um, yeah. That's a perfect segue into something that our podcast listeners love when we bring up right before I ask the last question. I'll just mention this. AJ is a vegetarian, vegan, as am I. And I'm sitting in a room with another one, and we haven't said anything about it once. And then we'll leave it at that for the rest of, for the, rest of the podcast listeners, just so you know. Right? Yeah, I, I always offer Paul gummy bears, and he doesn't want to eat the horse hooves or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the oddball out here, I guess. Yeah. I ate some ho hos today. I don't it's know, rare. I don't know if vegetarians eat ho hos today, but I ate some ho hos today. They weren't very good. I'm like, God, these things are dry as shit. Why did I buy some ho hos? You have an off in your life. Little Debbie's ho hos are way better than ho hos. You know, like, God damn, Little Debbie's would be way better investment in this ho ho. It depends when you offer me the gummy bears. Or some cold, camp, freezing cold. Mm. I'll, I'll probably eat it, but yeah. But what did that have to do with every podcast involves vegetarianism? Well, podcast <laughs> listeners love it when we talk about it. Okay. So it's, it's a hot, real hot button issue if we, you know, if we find somebody like Eddie Wall who wants to talk about juicing for a while and, okay. and, and being vegetarian, they're like, Eddie Wall's fucking cool, but don't talk to me about this shit. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll leave it there. And I'll ask you guys one last question each. Um, if you could go back and give yourself advice right now um, to that year or two before you started Rome. What um, what would you say? I would probably say go slower sometimes. You know, it's like you know, yeah, go slower sometimes. At, time, at times, we we probably could have gone slower. You know, um, with certain decisions, and uh, but you know, you, you make the decisions you make, and you learn from them. But. No fucking regrets. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yeah, go slower. You know, yeah, we we, we probably. We pushed into certain areas and decisions and, and expenditures, eh, maybe a little bit before we, we, we should have. And so if we just, you know, uh, gone a little bit more incrementally at times, you know, I think uh, that would have been yeah. probably better. Yeah, it's probably, I'd probably agree with that. Okay. On the other hand, there's never a right time to do something, so you don't know until you push that hard sometimes. True. Right. Yeah. I mean, on the other hand, I, I'm a big believer um, in at some point just saying yes and going going into something. Um, and I think most entrepreneurs uh, entrepreneurs will say the same thing. Right. At some point, you got to just try. Right. You got to make an effort, and um, it might not be the right effort. Or and but you 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 can't just sit there and plan forever. Right. Yeah. You you got to. Right. Go for it. Yeah, it's like when we started, there was no one was telling us it's a good time to start a snowboard company except one person, actually, that we talked to. It was just like, what are you doing? There's all these snowboard brands. And then it was the the 
the feedback that it was a good a good time was it's a good time. It's like that old, you know, that two guys on the Serengeti and one guy sees, they see a cheetah and then one guy starts lacing up his sneakers. He's like, why are you lacing it up? You're not going to beat the cheetah. He's like, I don't have to beat the cheetah. I have to beat you. <laughs> and that was the point of this guy's analogy was there's a ton of snowboard companies starting now. The retailers are going to be forced to say there's something happening here. Yeah. And all you have to do on some levels is be better than these other guys who are in the same well, we felt not in the same position as us, but yeah, very similar, starting out fresh. Elevation, um, Capita, Genius, Galleon out yeah. of Salt Lake City, if yeah. you guys know who they were. I do. Um, a lot. A line? Us. A line had already been around for a year, t- okay. two or three years probably. But yeah, they, 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 were, um, they were starting to transition into we a little bit by then. But yeah, there was a crop of upstarts and um, yeah. So. So anyway, yeah, point being, no one's going to, you know, it doesn't always look like the right time. As you, as you said, there's never the right time. So just, so. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I, I tried to hold it back as much as I could, but I, I genuinely thank you guys. Like, Rome's fucking awesome. Right it's been yeah, ages my life. It was yeah, awesome. Thank you, too, yeah. finally. Yeah, this was fun, yeah. I, uh, I've never done a podcast before, so it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Start listening right. to them now. <laughs> <laughs> I send them podcasts all the time to check out. Yeah, I didn't listen to that one. <laughs> I didn't listen to it. Uh, AJ, buddy, I will call you back in like 15 minutes on Skype, probably. Cool. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. It was rad talking to you. Yeah, yeah. Keep enjoying the season out there. You're, you're, you're lucky to get a, a big hammer uh, Sierra winter, for sure. You got another month of it yeah. there. Nice meeting you, AJ. Oh, uh, yeah. Nice, nice. You guys, too. Talk to you later. Later. Bye. You can follow Paul and Josh on Instagram at Rome Founders, but fair warning, their steady flow of pow picks will make you jealous. Hit me up at nate at shredsouls.com if you have interest in podcast camp, and go to www.shredsouls.com if you want to get in on the pre-sale for the most comfortable snowboarding insole ever created. Oh, and before I sign off, I have to give a huge shout out to Ben at the Snowboarders Journal for the article he did on the Not Snowboarding podcast in the first episode of the magazine this year. Ben, thank you so much, man. Okay, until next time, peace.